Hello everyone and welcome to the second tutorial on FIRST Robotics Programming. In this video, we'll go over the most basic function that every program will need, controlling actuators. Actuators are how your robot interacts with its environment. So if your robot has wheels, a shooter, or a climbing system, all of these are controlled using actuators. Luckily, all the actuators we use in the FRC boil down into two categories, motors and pneumatics, and I'll teach you both of those in this video. We'll cover how to control motor speed and direction, how to activate a compressor, as well as how to trigger pneumatic solenoids. I'll also show you a couple of files that our team has created which make it easier to work with double solenoids and floatable solenoids. So without further ado, let's get started. Alright, so I've opened up my Visual Studio Code and we're ready to get started with some programming. So today we're going to start by going over how to control motors from the code. So just like almost anything else in FRC programming, motors are an object. So first you have to create an instance of the object and then you can interact with it using different methods. So the motor object has actually already been created for us and it's included in the WPILib library, which will basically come pre-included in any FRC program that you make. So you don't need to worry about that at all. Now how we control the motor is actually by sending signals from the RoboRio to a motor controller. A motor controller is a device that acts kind of like a bridge. It takes a signal from the RoboRio, which is normally at a lower voltage, and then amplifies it to a higher voltage, which has enough power to power a motor. So basically, whenever we want to control the speed or direction of a motor, we need to do it from the motor controller class. So let's try that. So the motor controllers that we normally use in our robot are called Victors, like this. So let's do that and you'll see it's automatically imported at the top from the WPI lib library there. And let's make a new instance of this class. So Victor motor equals new Victor and you see here it needs int channel. So what this is, is actually the port number of which the motor controller is plugged into. So let's say our motor controller is plugged into port two, I don't know. And this is the PWM ports, by the way. All motor controllers are plugged into there. So now we have our instance of Victor set up. And you'll see it's giving us this error saying motor is never closed. And that's because right now I'm just writing this code from the main method of my program. But normally you'd be writing this from within the file for a subsystem, say shooter.java, and that error wouldn't be there. But anyway, now we have our motor created. So let's say we wanted to set the speed of the motor. Now all we need to do is type motor.set. And now this takes one argument, which is a double, and it's just the speed of the motor. So this number will go anywhere from negative one to one. So if I said one, or 1.0, because it's a double, doesn't really matter though, that would be full speed forward. The motor is going as fast as it possibly can with maximum voltage. Now if I said negative one, and now the motor is going backwards at full speed. And then if I was to say zero, the motor would be stopped. Now you can also say any number in between those ranges. So I could say 0.5, now the motor would be going forward on half speed, or I do the same thing, negative 0.5, now it's going backwards on half speed. But I could even say like 0.378. You can have some very accurate speeds in there if you wanted to. But really that's all there is to it, and that's how you set the speed of a motor. Now one more thing I should mention is that once you set the motor speed once, the motor will continue on that speed until you set it again. So that can come in handy, let's say if you're doing a shooter, all you need to do is set the speed to say, I don't know, set it to one, where you'll shoot at full speed, and then I'll wait a couple seconds. Once the shooter is finished, then I'll just say motor.set zero, and we'll stop the motor again. So that could be an example of how you might run a shooter. Once you set it once, it will just stay at that speed until you change it. So that's really all you need to know about motors. You create the instance here, and then you set the speed like this, any number between negative one and one. And remember, this will send signals to the motor controller, which will then amplify that signal and send the voltage to the actual motor. So next we'll move on to talking about pneumatics and how to control things like compressors and solenoids from within the code. Alright, so there's a couple of pneumatics components that I'm going to teach you about now. The first one is the compressor. The compressor is a device that plugs into a pneumatic control module 
and it basically just takes air from outside and pressurizes it, stores it into tanks. And this air is how the other components actually work. So the compressor needs to be ran before you can do any other stuff with pneumatics. So I'll just show you how to get that started in the code. So just like the motors, we basically just need to make an instance of the class, in this case, the compressor class. So we'll import that from first WPI lib. And now we'll make a new instance. So we'll just call it C to make it shorter. So compressor C equals new compressor. And there's actually no arguments for this constructor. So it's like that, we have our compressor. And there's only a couple methods that you really need to worry about. And that is C dot start and C dot stop. And I'm sure you can imagine what those do. The start method will turn on the compressor and the stop method will turn off. But there is one more interesting thing about this method. As you can see here, the start method will start the compressor running in closed loop control mode. Now you might hear the terms closed loop and open loop coming up a lot in robotics, so I'll just explain what those mean. Closed loop is that the robot has a sensor that's receiving feedback and it's using that information to change something on the robot. So in this case for the compressor, there's actually a built-in pressure switch that can detect when the tanks have reached the desired pressure level, which I think is around 120 PSI for first. So the switch will detect once we've hit that amount and will stop the compressor automatically. So really, you don't need to use the c.stop method at all. If you call start once, it'll fill up the compressor and then stop once it reaches that maximum amount. And then, let's say you're during your match and we use some pneumatics, we use our pistons for example, and that will take some air out of the tanks. The compressor will realize we don't have enough pressure and then it will fill up automatically and you only ever need to call the start method one time. But, the other thing you want to consider is the compressor actually uses a lot of power, especially when the tank is almost full. It takes a lot of energy just to get that last bit of air in. And normally during a match, that's what will happen. You'll use a little bit of air and then the compressor will run again to squeeze a tiny bit more into the tanks. So what our team actually did last year was not run the compressor at all. We had it stop like this. And what we would do is just before the match, we'd fill up the tank of air with a different battery. Then we'd put on a new battery that's fresh for the match and we'd have this compressor uh, not run at all during the game. And we found that we actually were able to have enough air in our tanks that we didn't need to use the compressor at all. And that saved a lot of power, which let us use our motors and our shooter with just more effectiveness because we had more power on the robot. So it's kind of up to you to figure out and talk with your other team members and decide if the compressor is something you want to have running during the match or not. And then one more thing about the compressor is there's this method, which is compressor.enable. And this doesn't actually do anything. It's just a function that returns a value, Boolean, true or false, and it tells you if the compressor is running. So if the tank is empty and it is filling up, then it would tell you true. But let's say you called start here, but the tank is actually full. So the closed loop control detected that and it turned off the compressor. This enabled method would now tell you false because the compressor is not filling up with air. So this will basically just let you know if your tank is full or not. So that's all you need to know about compressors. I hope that helped. And now we'll start talking about solenoids. So you probably guessed there is already a solenoid class that's given to you by first. So we will be using that when you're working with solenoids. So let's just say solenoid S equals new solenoid that. And this one actually does have an argument here, channel. And so this is just the port that that solenoid is plugged into on the pneumatics control module. So you wanna make sure obviously that you're activating the right solenoid. Now what a solenoid is, is basically an electromagnet and it can be powered or on or off and it will open and close a valve. And that allows air to flow into a pneumatic device like a piston or anything like that. So the solenoid basically controls the flow of air and allows you to use your pneumatics. Let's say our solenoid is in port zero for now. And so now we have our solenoid and there's only really one method that is important for solenoids and that is the set. And that will basically say, turning the value on or off. So we can set true or false, whether you want that solenoid to be activated or deactivated. And that's all you need to know about solenoids.
So normally, when you're working with pneumatics on a first robot, you'll find that we won't actually be using just those regular solenoids very often. Normally, we'll be using double solenoids or floatable solenoids, and I'll explain those to you right now. So a double solenoid is basically what it sounds like. It's two solenoids that work together. So, for example, if you had pistons that you wanted to be able to extend and then retract, you'd need a double solenoid. One controls the extension, and the other one controls the retraction. So our team has actually created its own class to make it easier to use double solenoid commands, which is called double solenoid toggler. I'll just create a new instance of this. All right. And you'll see this actually needs two arguments now, a port for forward and a port for reverse. So let's say um, the forward solenoid would be connected to port zero, and the second one would be port one. And this is again on the pneumatics control module. So now that we have our double solenoid toggler, let's see some of the methods that we have. We have first our extend method like this, and now we'll extend it forwards. We have our retract method that will retract our double solenoid. And also, this is one that we added, a toggle method. The toggle method will toggle the state of the solenoid. So if it's currently retracted, then it will extend. And if it's currently extended, then it will retract. And then one other thing that might be useful is this variable extended. And this variable just keeps track of whether or not the solenoid is extended. And it'll be true if it is and false if it isn't. So that's all you really need to know about the double solenoid toggler. There is one more class that we've created, which is called floatable solenoid. So floatable solenoid is a little bit different in that instead of having one forward mode and a backward mode, it also has a float mode. And this is where um, the air is kind of released from the valve so you can move the piston or whatever freely. So normally on a double solenoid, when it's extended, you can't push it back in by hand. And when it's retracted, you can't pull it out by hand. But on a floatable solenoid, you can have the piston go on float mode and it will be able to move easily. And so in order to do that, we actually need two ports for forward. One is forward and then the other one is the float and then two ports for backwards. One is the backwards and the other one is float. And I know that sounds really confusing, but once you sort out what the ports are one time, you won't really need to work with those again. You'll just be able to use extend and retract method. So it isn't that confusing. So let's call this floatable solenoid um, S. And you'll see here we have an argument for the subsystem that it's a part of, but we're not gonna worry about subsystems just yet. So let's say zero, one, two, and three are the ports. And so just like before, you'll see we have the extend method, the retract method, and now we have this new method that's called enable float, and that will turn the float on so the piston can now be um, pushed by hand into a certain position. Now another important thing to note is that if I called the extend method again after, that would turn the float off. So if I wanted to extend it and then put, keep the float on, I would have to enable float again. And then this one also has an is extended method, similar to the extended variable from before, that will just let you know if that piston is currently being extended or not. So that's really all there is to know about solenoids. We covered compressors, solenoids, double solenoids, and floatable solenoids, and I hope that all made sense. In the next video, we're gonna start going through the process of writing an entire robot program. So I'm gonna start by writing the code for the subsystems using a lot of these commands that we learned today about pneumatics and motors, and then later we'll start learning about commands and then how to put all those together to make a complete robot program. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.